Well, hey, everybody. I'm so wicked excited that you folks came. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the platform, um, but um, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. You can um, chat, send me little messages um, in the chat box as the presentation um, progresses. There's also a little um, icon to request um, speaking. If you don't have a microphone um, connection to your computer, just um, type in your comments. Hey, Julie, how are you? Hi from Arkansas, that's so cool. Um, yeah, that would be really awesome if folks could just kind of drop a little message and um, let me know where you're, where you're from and, and who's here. So um, I'm really, really excited um, to have so many folks register for this conference. Um, I know I do encourage folks to register even if they can't attend the live event because then that gives them access to the replay. And um, I love the fact that there are so many like-minded folks that are really passionate about this topic and the patients that we are privileged to serve. So I am so excited. Oh my heavens to Betsy. So here it's all pouring in. I've got Austin, Texas. I've got Robert. Oh, Roberta. Hey, Bertie. How are you? Vancouver. Um, hey, Pam from North Carolina. Wanda from Texas. This is so wicked awesome. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to just give ourselves another little minute. Let my um, HPA access chill a little bit and um, hopefully um, you'll find this really informative and um, also kind of um, the opportunity to take action. Hey, Carolyn, Mass General, whoop, whoop, Joanna, hi, how are ya? Nancy, oh, hi, oh, Carol, hi, how's it going? Claire, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. Um, what I'm hoping is um, to kind of present the facts, Jack, about this um, subject, um, open up to some dialogue. And so, you know, get those little fingers limbered up to um, start typing in some stuff. But I'm also going to um, invite folks to um, join, um, join a tribe of um, like minded folks that are as passionate as I am about this subject um, towards the end of the um towards the end of the seminar, uh, the webinar rather. So I hope you find that interesting. Holy moly, someone from Puerto Rico. That is so awesome. Welcome, Francis. Thank you so much for joining. Um, okay, so whew, it's 11.02 and I am going to kickstart this topic that um, is just so profoundly relevant. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of our um, clinician colleagues are unaware of the risk of suicide uh, to to individuals who are born um, premature or um, low birth weight, that they have a significant high risk of um, suicide attempts um, that begin to present themselves in adolescence and progress as being one of the leading causes of death in adults that were um, born premature. And um, you know, this kind of information is, I mean, it's out there, but it's not in the uh, literature that I think a lot of us and a lot of our colleagues routinely, you know, kind of go to as our go to um, source. And, um, but yet it's really um, crit critically important. Um, I'm still a little bit nervous. So, um, but um, so I'm going to take you through this. And the way I've framed this talk is really looking at suicide prevention and really trying to get some, some um, weight behind it, some power behind behind this opportunity that we have to really embrace suicide prevention in the NICU. And what is the number one um, intervention? Not to like, you know, end the, the webinar now, but the number one um, intervention to reduce suicide risk is really parental partnership, parental presence, and fostering competence and confidence in parents to be that primary loving, compassionate, 24-7 caregiver to their infant. That it's that, that particular um, disconnect that occurs at the birth of a premature or critically ill infant actually begin, begins a cascade of events that sets this individual on a developmental trajectory that undermines not only their physiological health and well-being, but their psychosocial and emotional health and well-being um, also. So here we go. Suicide prevention in the NICU. And I put it a question mark because I, I was afraid that folks might see that and be a little bit off put. But is this something that we really should embrace? So, um, OK, here we go. <laughs> um, my objectives is to inform the participants of the inherent safety risks of hospitalized infants. And at the end, I want to encourage you to, to join the tribe. And so the case for change, the case for really um, 
shining a light on the fact that these individuals, once they become adolescents and, and transition into adulthood, have a much significantly higher risk of psychomorbidity um, than any other newborn cohort. Um, this was an excellent paper that was pre um, uh, presented by um, uh, Johnson and Marlowe, Neil Marlowe, he's out of the UK, um, talking about this risk as we're saving smaller and smaller people. We're saving sicker and sicker um, individuals um, at that cusp of viability, which continually gets pushed back. And um, what these authors have really kind of concluded is that there is a clear preterm um, behavioral phenotype. And the phenotype is the expression of how these individuals walk through the world. Now, we're very um, used to kind of a a physiologic or an anatomic phenotype that we see in NICU survivors. And you know, some of my colleagues will say that they can identify who were the premature people when they walk through the mall based on cranial deformation. Um, but it, you know, and, and I mean, that's also a sad state of affairs, but um, there's also a behavioral phenotype, how these individuals um, express themselves. And just as an FYI, 50 to 70% of infants born premature by 18 months of age, demonstrate um, internalizing behaviors and externalizing behaviors. And these behavioral manifestations are precursors to um, depression, anxiety. Um, the um, externalizing behaviors um, can uh, be precursors to a phenomenon or, or yeah, a phenomenon called um, oppositional defiance disorder. These are individuals that are aggressive and acting out. And kind of the um, the physiology that underpins this or actually the neurobiology that underpins this is a challenge in regulating emotions and we learn as human beings we learn how to regulate our emotions um you know under the wing if you will of another loving adult who hopefully can uh, regulate their emotions right and usually that's our parents we learn how to respond to different situations based on how we watch and how not just visually but how we sense um our parents or our caretakers re respond to situations. So for example, you think about a young baby who's perched on uh, their mom or dad's hip and a stranger approaches. Now the, the mother may know this individual, but the baby does not. What the baby does, the baby gets on, a, uh, gets on a, a heightened state of alertness, okay? The HPA axis is activated and they're on guard. They are, they're not sure of what's gonna happen. How, how, how are things gonna go down here, okay? They're not consciously processing that, but at the very primal level, there's a tension in their system that this may be an unsafe situation and they watch their parent. They watch their parent, maybe have tension because they don't know this person. They, the parent begins that verbal, um, you know, exchange becomes comfortable with the individual, and you and the baby actually feels the mother or the father's um, sense of safety now over overcome them, and then the baby can then feel safe. Um, the same thing happens in the NICU. Okay, so think about us as clinicians. All right, um, and it's incredibly busy in the NICU, and there's always something going on, and there's always some event happening. Um, you know, I mean, it's an ICU. And so oftentimes we walk around our day with that heightened sense of anticipation. Something's going to happen. I have to be on alert. And we can bring that frenetic energy, that heightened sense of awareness to our caring encounters, certainly with the baby and also with the parents. We may not um, plan to be abrupt, or, or, you know, kind of short um, because we're thinking I've got uh, all these other things and now they're asking me all these questions and I know this is important information for them, but I've really got to run off. And the way that we um, are transmitting that energy, that frenetic distraction, our HPA axis activation can be misinterpreted by the parent, but for the baby who's profoundly vulnerable to the energy and the emotion that's around them, that can actually activate and escalate an HPA response in them as well. Why am I going off on this, you know, with just because of this slide? I'm really trying to connect the data that these individuals have discovered with the day-to-day -day lived experience and, and lived, yeah, the lived experience that we have and our patients have and their families in the NICU. So as we're seeing smaller and smaller people um, survive the NICU course, what we are seeing concomitantly then is a significant increase in psychiatric morbidity the onset it generally is um, in adolescence. Although if you looked at these individuals, um, 
these adolescent individuals, if you looked back in their history, you would probably see a breadcrumb trail of behavioral challenges and um, learning challenges and stuff like that, that may have been precursors, but it's very difficult to um, diagnose, you know, um, these kinds of conditions because, I mean, and there's a lot of, um, baggage um, connected with um, psycho uh, psychiatric diagnoses um, that they, they tend to be labels and there's a whole um, bunch of kind of um, other, oh, I'm, I'm losing the word, but other phenomenon that are associated when you diagnose someone or someone is known to have mental illness, then there are all these other things that kind of come along with that person. Um, they tend to have um, challenges with isolation, um, uh, integration into, you know, different, no, even just families, all right? There, there's challenges there. So um, psychologists are very reticent to label children too young in their developmental progression. And that is a huge challenge that the psychiatric community is um, battling. And they're battling that using uh, trauma-informed care, which of course has its roots in um, behavioral health and wellness and talking about how, you know, these behavioral expressions that we're seeing in these adolescents and adults is the result of early life adversity. And if any of you have heard me talk before, you know, this is my, uh, you know, the thing that I always talk about um, because it can be changed and, um, and it doesn't need to be the way it is. But um, we can't change things until people really understand what are these long-term consequences. And then that informs us then to begin the transformation. It hopefully also empowers us to begin the transformation as well. But these psychopathologies, uh, the graph that you see to the right was really um, created by the original authors based on um, a paper uh, from 2009. This is Lindstrom et al. They did a national cohort study. Um, so it was a, a Swedish cohort and they've extrapolated their results to um, reflect this growing um, volume of patients that are now being, um, that are surviving at younger and younger gestational ages. The thing that I want you to um, pay attention to is, um, so the, um, the odds ratio for these um, psychopathologies being a problem. So if an odds ratio is one, it's, it's null. But if it's greater than one, it's, it's telling you that there is a significant correlation between the, the GA and the, um, psychiatric phenomenon. And so you can see, you know, there is some overlap with the extremely small people, but that the majority of the um, individuals, um, they, they, they were finding a correlation, an association rather, um, between their extreme prematurity and their psychopathology. And this, um, these findings actually bear out when you look at the World Health Organization, they um, publish these, it's kind of every decade, I wish it was a little bit more frequently, but it must be a super cumbersome job to look at the global burden of disease across, you know, only a kajillion diseases. But they also do the global burden of disease associated with prematurity and other neonatal complications. And there's a myriad of them, but of course the one that I have really um, been focused on is the, the psychological um, and the psychopathological global burden of disease associated with um, prematurity and neonatal complications. But now look at me, I've been in, in, in neonatal nursing for over 30 years and I'm just discovering this over the past five to 10 years. You know, well, maybe five to seven years, you know, that I'm just discovering this. And so, you know, there's a, a whole bunch of our colleagues that have no idea that there's actually a connection and a link and that the evidence that we're now being exposed to is showing us how that connection actually happens. And it happens through this phenomenon of um, toxic stress or trauma or early life adversity. There's a myriad of different um, terms that folks use to describe this lived experience. But when you look at it from a um, biological perspective, I'm gonna turn you over to the um, paper of um, Nussick and Miller from 2016. I didn't include it in this reference list, but um, if somebody sends me a message, I'll, I'll actually, I'll write it. I'll write a note to myself, Nussick and Miller. They do this really cool, um, paper, they, they published this really cool paper that helped us understand what this process is. So toxic stress elicits a, um, a fight or flight response. 
And in addition to cortisol, it's not just cortisol that is released in response to a profound stressor, but there is a whole bunch of inflammatory mediators. Now, these inflammatory mediators, they, they tend to hang around for a while. And if the stress transitions from an acute event into a chronic event, which is what happens to um, NICU folks specifically, and there are other patient populations and situations that also... Um, confer a chronic stress uh, situation or milieu. Um, but in a state of chronic stress, there's a surge of cortisol, there's a surge of cytokines, uh, tumor necrosis factor, in factor, interleukins, all these other inflammatory mediators that don't go back down to ground zero. They actually maintain this kind of low level or subclinical phenomenon of um, chronic inflammation. And what's really interesting about this phenomenon is that it's been very well studied in adult ICU patient populations by this guy called Bruce McEwen. So Bruce McEwen is kind of one of the first folks that really looked at how trauma triggers this reaction and, and, and starts up this um, activation um, in our neurobiology, releasing all these neuroendocrine um, hormones and, and other types of um, mechanisms that get us ready to engage in a fight. But what he studied then is, okay, that happens. But what does that mean for the, the sick person? And he's the one that has demonstrated that it actually deranges and undermines healing, recovery, um, extends your length of stay, increases your vulnerability to infection. Um, and so this really brilliant nurse researcher, Tiffany Moore, um, took that model of allostasis, which is the stress response. So homeostasis is everything's chill, everything's operating and we're breathing and all of you guys hopefully have op, you know good functioning homeostatic activity right now that you can pay attention and listen to me go on this filibuster about this phenomenon. But homeostasis is the thing that keeps the engine running. Allostasis is your stress response. It's not all bad. When you have a, a positive stress, positive allostasis, it hits the system and it causes and invites the system to adapt and then, you know, kind of set a new plateau, a new uh, normal, if you will. When, when the allostasis is overwhelming, though, it becomes a load. And, the, and that's the term that Bruce McEwen uses, as does Tiffany Moore. An allostatic load then starts beating down on the system and, system and you start seeing this degradation in homeostatic functioning. And her hypothesis from her original paper, which I believe was in 2011, I'm going to write down here the Moore paper for you guys, um, was mirroring what McEwen had done and looking at is this phenomenon of allostasis and allostatic load actually a contributing factor, not a straight line, but a contributing factor to um, a lot of the diseases that we see in our patient population that is mediated by inflammation. So what are those diseases that we see in the NICU that are mediated by inflammation? You can text or I can tell you. I mean, some of the ones that she mentioned in her paper, she looked at intraventricular hemorrhage and, and post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, um, chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary disease, uh, dysplasia. She looked at retinopathy of prematurity and other perturbations, you know, infection, um, increased risk for infection and that sort of thing. So, um, yes, exactly. So, um, and if you think about the biology of this process, it really does make sense. I mean, it's not... I think sometimes as clinicians, and I know I was guilty of this too as a NICU clinician, as a nurse practitioner, I wished it was easy to figure out how I could help the patient. I wanted you to just, it be this, and then I would just order this, and the patient would be better. But it's not. We're, we're complex organisms. We're dynamic organisms. And it's not just one thing. It's a myriad of things that all intermingle and interweave to either optimize health and wellness or degrade and undermine health and wellness. And that's what's really happening in our patient population. And we've looked at a lot of these medical morbidities that we see associated with prematurity. And we're really digging in and trying to find some really effective strategies that we can Im um, implement during the neonatal period or the you know infant period to reduce you know kind of the long-term um, pulmonary morbidity that we see in our patient population and feeding and stuff like that which is really obviously really important but really we need to shift our, our mindset um, and stop looking at additional interventions to add to the mix I mean not that that's a bad thing 
But remember what the, the title of this presentation is. It's a prevention. I mean, I'm talking about suicide prevention. And again, the best thing that we can do to prevent suicide and, and have a, a really nice domino effect on a lot, not a lot of other um, morbidities that aff afflict this patient population and their families. It's the parents, it's that connectedness, it's that sense of safety. So um, to kind of just share a little bit more about um, the psychopathologies that, um, are, uh, that afflict this patient population. In the paper from Nassardi in 2012, um, this guy and his group looked at um, a cohort of premature people compared to their term counterparts and discovered that infants born prematurely absolutely had a higher risk of um, non-effective psychosis, which is schizophrenia, more likely to have depression or depressive disorders and anxiety disorders as well, and bipolar. And what was also interesting is they actually noticed a stratification that even, and the high, the, I'm sorry, the more premature you were, the higher your risk of becoming, uh, of having a psychological pathology. Um, schizophrenia and delusional disorders are examples of non-effective psychosis as opposed to bipolar disorder, which is an affective psychosis. But again, all of this originates from that sub, those subcortical structures have been influenced and impacted by the early life adversity that was endured by these individuals during a vulnerable and sensitive and critical period of development. And we know this now from the good work of Ruth Feldman, who's really examined um, quite extensively um, the role of biobehavioral synchrony and relationships and those senses of safety and um, connectedness. There's a lovely paper that was just published in January of 2018 by my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Marilyn Sanders from Connecticut Children's called Trauma-Informed Care in the NICU. It's an open access paper. I'm gonna put that down too. Um, that where she really explains um, the biological relevance based off of polyvagal theory that was coined by the work of Dr. Stephen Porges. Have, have, have any of you guys heard of Dr. Stephen Porges? He's an insanely smart um, neuropsychologist who began his work, um, again, really interested in the vagal nerve and um, that the vagal nerve actually isn't one single nerve. Um, it has three roots um, and that these roots, you know, kind of um, are responsible for different parts of where the vagus nerve innervates um, within our body. It's either supradiaphragmatic or subdiaphragmatic. And a lot of the chronic stress and toxic stress that individuals in general endure uh, negatively impacts the, um, the vagal tone in the subdiaphragmatic area. So let's think about what organs are innervated by the um, subdiaphragmatic vagus. And the biggest organ in that area is the gut. And think about the gut and, and, and stress. I mean, this is in grownups. But think about the gut and stress with regards to our vulnerable patient population. We see a lot of these individuals in our NICUs. Um, I mean, reflux is just the scourge of um, the NICU. I mean, babies, parents, clinicians, everybody. Um, now, we, we do know what the evidence says. The evidence says that there's nothing we can do about it. But I, I wanna just kind of share with you this wicked cool experience that I had with a group of um, clinicians in um, Belgium um, many, many years ago when I was working with Children's Medical Ventures and I was working with um, Sharon Gibbons and Steve Hoth, and um, the, the, who was a neonatologist out of um, Cincinnati Children's. And um, we came up with this idea of these core measures for developmental care. And we, um, we were patting ourselves on the back, all happy that we put this thing together, but we weren't sure if it was gonna make any difference. Was it gonna be any better than what was already existing with regards to this lovely level three NICU in um, Belgium volunteered to work with us and they were going to incorporate these core measures into their um, culture of care. And the core measures uh, that have been endorsed by the National Association of Neonatal Nurses are the five core measures, the healing environment, pain and stress, protected sleep, ADLs, and of course the family. 
And each of these core measures has three attributes and each attribute has three criteria. Don't get freaked out about that. That just goes to show you how wicked, crazy and intense we were about really trying to be very quantifiable about what developmental care would look like. So I digress. So I get back, get back to the uh, NICU in Belgium. And we worked with them over a period of 18 months. And they, um, they looked, they um, compared their outcomes pre and post the intervention with their, um, their national NICU database. So we looked at kind of the same laundry list of um, morbidities that most folks look at, you know, um, IVH, sepsis, reflux, um, mm, oxygen, you know, at discharge and stuff like that. And then they also looked at uh, two year follow up, which was wicked awesome. We were just so excited to have that kind of data. Um, what was really interesting, and um, we really need to replicate this in a deliberate way, but in their group, they had a 75% decrease in the incidence of reflux in the post intervention period. And I should share this with you that um, their neonatal um, medical team was the same team. You know, it wasn't, you know, kind of like how we have a lot of um, different players every month and that sort of thing. They were a very cohesive team. So it wasn't as a result of different interventions because they were very um, consistent in their practices. And so um, in our debrief about the program afterwards, there will be a recording afterwards. Um, in the debrief afterwards about this particular outcome, we really started talking about reflux being a manifestation of stress. We know this in um, older uh, children and adults that reflux is associated with stress. And we now are beginning to understand what that connection is, that it is mediated by vagal tone. It is mediated by autonomic, your sympathetic nervous system sensitivity to the environment and how you are wired. Are you kind of one of those edgy, stressed out people? Exactly. You know, or are you kind of a chill and you roll with the, the punches? Well, you learn either one of those um, ways to walk through the world, again, based on your early experiences. You know, um, I mean, you you learn how to live by where well, you live what you learn because you've learned what you've lived, if, if that makes sense. Right. Um, so if you've lived a world that's been very stressful, very inconsistent, very unpredictable, kind of scary, kind of isolative and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have a more elevated stress response. You're going to become stress intolerant. And so the question that I have in the absence of any anatomy, anatomical abnormalities, are we actually seeing stress, that this reflux may actually be stress? So decreasing environmental stressors, exactly, Carol, um, may actually be, go, be, be the magic bullet that we're looking for. And I think one of the biggest environmental stressors for these individuals is isolation. How can we more continuously have parental presence? And I, I'm not trying to open up a can of worms. I'm just trying to like challenge you to really think creatively um, because the parents are also traumatized. And having a baby in the NICU may actually re-traumatize them. They may have a history of other kinds of things where somebody died in the hospital, somebody very close to them. It may have happened at a very young age. So they're also wired for this hypervigilance and this very stressing situation. And so when we see them in the NICU or we don't see them in the NICU, is there something else going on? And it really begs the, the question, you know, why don't we have dedicated psychology staff in the NICU, I mean, beyond social work, I mean, social worker, social workers in the NICU, at least my experience with them, is they are so overburdened with so many tasks. And, you know, I, I've actually spoken with the perinatal um, social work um, association folks. And I mean, they're just so challenged. They want to help, but they're, they're also very limited because of the current um, recommendations for how many social workers, you know, per NICU bed and all that other kind of stuff. Um, but psychologists, I know over in the EU that it is really pretty standard that they have a psychologist on staff who works with not just the patients and the families, but also the clinicians. Um, because please know that um, bearing witness to the worst thing that can happen to a fellow human being takes a toll on us as well. We're not so open about sharing that because we like to, you know, pull up our bootstraps and be really tough and stuff all of that pain and suffering down and just move through it. But when you do that, it actually degrades your ability to care, to be compassionate and to be humane.
And so I know I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of going back and forth, but I, I see all of this intertwined because it's, you know, burnout is one of the reasons why we struggle with, you know, embracing and incorporating a lot of these evidence-based practices in human caring, compassionate caring. Um, so we have to really look at all of the different players in, in the environment to really help create a suicide prevention initiative from the get-go. But, you know, we kind of have to go backwards a little bit. We have to address the legacy, this, the current situation, address that in a meaningful way, and then put in place our prevention strategy. So we're coming at it in both directions. I mean, these these um, psychopathologies, these are quality of life busters. Um, in a you know recent publication, and there actually there were several other papers too, um, but I was really trying to be um, you know focused. But um, but the thing that um, I just want to share with you is the papers that I was discovering were not found in your traditional neonatal journals, and that's that's not so good for us, you know, for the folks that just like my go-to journal is advances, which is awesome. Or my go-to is new nail network or AOTA or, you know, these are, we all have our go-to journals, but there's only a million journals out there. And, um, that, that's kind of one of the, the joys that I have in my job. Um, as anybody on here knows, I can be a little nerdy. Um, and I love my nerdness and I love finding this information and I love most importantly sharing it. My role as a nurse practitioner really, and then transitioning into an educator really, um, showed how I can, I can, and you can too, but I can make a difference. Um, not on just my assignment, right. But by empowering and informing my colleagues who then touch so many people and then they touch so many people and we role model for each other. And, um, thanks. I'm going to embrace my nerdy self because we, 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 everybody on this call, I'm going to bet dollars to donuts. You're all nerds and that's wonderful. And it's, and you're passionate because you're spending your lunch hour with me and we can make a difference. We just need to kind of break down some of the barriers and, and, um, and kind of craft a strategy that's um, going to really reconnect our colleagues, our, the crispy critters, the barbers, if you will. Uh, not that there's, you know, there's no offense to any barbers on the call. Um, to reconnect with their heart-centered purpose of why we do this work, and knowing what happens to these individuals when they're adolescents and adults is relevant for me. It is because it re it's a reflection of the job that I did when they were their most vulnerable, when they were their most sensitive, when they were their most fragile, and the families as well. Many of these families are there; they become fractured from this crisis, and and we're not so great at telling them. I mean, you can't you don't you can't share what you don't know. So if we don't know that psychopathology is one of the morbidities that they're going to have down the road, you know what happens to these this this group, this constellation of morbidities? They become uh, known as the minor morbidities. And of course, and you use the word minor to me, I think no big deal. We can get through this. I mean, we just had a life-threatening situation that we plowed through, right? So, oh, it's a minor morbidity. What is that? Have you guys looked at the list of what constitutes minor morbidities? Psychopathology is a minor morbidity. Learning deficits is a minor morbidity. Depression, anxiety, minor morbidities. Neurodevelopmental deficits, minor morbidities. Well, they're not so minor if you're living with them. They're not minor. Anything that degrades someone's someone from their original blueprint is not minor. It's major. It's just not medical, right? I mean, like in a traditional sense. So we re there's so much work that we have to do. And I, as much as I'm trying to do it, I can't do it alone. And um, so I, I'm, I'm setting you up. Um, and so what, what my idea is, is, you know, as I'm looking at what's really going to speak to uh, the, the movers and the shakers, right? The people that are crafting um, the uh, the rules about healthcare, the rules about what we focus on. Um, and so what I came across, okay, is uh, CMS, you know, the Centers for uh, Medicaid and, uh, what is it, Medicaid and Medicare Services. They have this whole list of, um, I mean, it's a huge list. I'm going to actually share it with you, of what's called hospital acquired conditions. And we're familiar with some of them, but we're not familiar with all of them and the nuances of all of them. 
But actually, what piqued my interest about this was actually kind of a couple of years ago when I was working with Children's of Atlanta, um, Myra Rolf, a wicked awesome chick and smart, passionate nurse. Um, she was, you know, she's super passionate about developmental care. And she was saying, you know, I think a lot of these outcomes that we see in these babies, like reflux, like um, behavioral challenges, learning deficits, you know, maybe they are also hospital acquired conditions. And I thought, I love where you're going with that girl. I need to, you know, check back in. And so I finally did finally check back in. And this is, these are the definitions um, that CMS has. So hospital acquired conditions. And of course it's from a fiscal perspective. These are high cost or high volume or both. These result in the assignment of a case to a DRG, a diagnosis related group, that has a higher payment when present as a secondary diagnosis. So your primary diagnosis is prematurity. There's some number that's associated with that and there's a dollar value to that. But then you get um, BPD, then you, or chronic lung disease, then you get IVH, then you get all these other things, right? And that adds on to them. But they're all within the hospital because they're short. We're short term. We don't see what's brewing underneath, underneath the pot. What's percolating? What are these disgraces and perturbations that we're now seeing and how this human being is being wired to move through the rest of the world? And in the wake of all this new research, however, um, specifically around the epigenetics, um, and I at the last Science and Soul conference that we had um, this past February in Belgium, one of our second keynote, our first keynote was um, Heidi, Heidi Zals, and our other keynote was Dr. Rosario Monteroso. He's a psychologist researcher out of uh, Milan, Italy, and his team is doing an extensive amount of work on early life adversity prematurity and its consequences. Um, he has done a prolific amount of research and one of his latest studies now is actually looking at, uh, well, one of the papers looked at the um, how toxic stress or early life adversity um, causes methylation to serotonin, serotonergic transporter genes. Now, serotonin is um, a mood stabilizer, right? It's the um, neuro... Uh, neuropeptide that's responsible for your mood and that sort of thing. So when you have alterations in its ability to do its job, one of its jobs in transporting um, the, you know, the different molecules back and forth, then you're going to see uh, behavioral um, abnormalities um, associated with that. One, one of the other things that they, they've now discovered is that the telomeres, okay, so the telomeres, think about the chromosome, the telomeres are the um, spokes, if you will. And on the spokes are these um, little caps. And now this is me, not the non-scientist explaining this, okay? You know when you have um, a chair and you don't want it to drag across your hardwood floor, so you put those little cushion caps on it? So there are those little cushion caps on the end of these um these chromosomes and they're finding that they're getting shorter and shorter and shorter and that they're noticing an association between the shortness, the shortening and the um, degree of toxic stress that the organism is being exposed to. What are the biological short-term and long-term outcomes? They're yet to be uncovered. But again, we are changing these individuals at that level, at that minute discrete level. We own that. We own at least a degree of it. How can we mitigate and manage it? So it is hospital acquired to an extent. Because if you look at the third um, parameter here, is that a hospital acquired condition could have reasonably, reasonably been prevented through the application of evidence-based guidelines. Bum, bum, bum. We have evidence-based guidelines for trauma-informed neuroprotective care. And so I think, yes, oh, yes, Barbara, yes. So Cotty is on there and stuff like that as well. So I'm going to show you in a second. But again, you know, we've got these evidence-based guidelines for a lot of different things. And we have them for developmental care, but we're just not being um, as vigilant and as accountable to these best practices as we should and could be. And if we should and could and were, would we then see a reduction in some of these longer-term minor morbidities or psychopathologies and behavioral challenges that we're seeing in NICU survivors. And so here is the list. Now, 
I've made this so beautiful for you guys because if you saw the spreadsheet that I downloaded from CMS with an explanation of this is each bullet had at least 50 additional rows of more um, discrete qualifiers for what that meant. And, and if you if you want it, I'm happy to share it with you. But um, so this is the list and there are 14 hospital acquired conditions that have been identified um, by the CMS. So far, an object retained after surgery, air embolism, blood incompatibility, stage three and four pressure ulcers, falls in trauma. I'm going to come back to that. Caudi, you know, catheter associated, um, line associated um, infections, surgical site infections, um, poor glycemic control, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism to with, with a total knee, surgical site uh, infection from bariatric surgery, from orthopedic surgery, following cardiac implant, and iatrogenic pneumothorax um, with the um, catheterization. But I want to, oh, oops, fudge. I want, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But I wanted to come back to trauma. And um, so trauma, again, we're, we're still struggling with um, people's understanding of the definition of trauma. But trauma is not always physiologic, right? It is psychosocial. It is whatever the individual perceives as a threat, as a life threat to their integrity. And so the patients that we serve are indeed experiencing a trauma. We have validation of that through the literature um, and the you know um, work from the, um, oh, fudge. Uh, Fudge, the group that has the website talking about pediatric medical trauma, the recent publication by Amy Degada um, describing the infant medical trauma in the NICU um, model to help frame how we are going to um, improve the care that we are providing. And if you want those papers, I'm happy to share as well. Um, but trauma. And so if indeed trauma is considered a hospital acquired condition, then it gives us and we have evidence based best practice guidelines, then we have the opportunity then to address this in a meaning, meaningful way. And we can position the work that we need to do as addressing this CMS requisite in, in, in trying to reduce the occurrence of hospital acquired conditions. But it's not just CMS that we can put in our pocket for success. It's also, these are the 2018 Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals. And they um, update them every year. Um, and they, they often don't change. In fact, I don't think these guys have changed for a while. But the one that I want you to look like, so it's always about patient identifying patient correctly, improving staff communication, alarm safety because of all the issues around alarm fatigue, preventing infection, but it's the blue one here. Mistakes in surgery is also important to do. But identifying patient safety risks. Now the small print for this patient safety goal, interestingly, is about identifying patients at risk for suicide. But then when you look at the even finer print for that qualifier, it's only looking at um, patients at risk for suicide who are in a behavioral health setting, who are hospitalized because of their risk for suicide. And so it, may, it it's almost like, but we're, so we're letting you off the hook. If anyone else, um, you know, demonstrate, you know, verbalize a suicide ideation or it has an increased risk for suicide unless they're in um, that kind of a setting. But I think, you know, all of these, both of these, um, these goals in the CMS are being informed by, by non-neonatal clinicians. And so it's not that they're not, I mean, they're, they're, I, the verbiage is there for us to glom onto and really delineate and further illustrate what the risks are for our unique patient population from a short-term and a long-term perspective. Um, and I think what we need to do then is kind of flesh that out because what we know for sure that this, why this is so important is that we know toxic stress is a mediator between early childhood adversity and suboptimal outcomes from learning behavior and health, both physical and mental. We also know that social supportive and nurturing interactions counteract that stress and can even cultivate resilience in the patient population. And so the, the reason why this is important is by our understanding and, and policymakers and everybody else's understanding of the biology underlying early stress, we can come up with new primary prevention and earlier intervention strategies. We know, oops, fudge, sorry. Um, 
this the, by reducing the global burden of preterm birth and and the disease the global burden of prematurity in general it we have to move from this first gra graph which is really looking at our existing paradigm is looking at the to improve things at a very linear way like we do a systematic review we take the results of that we decide if we want to do it or not we want to embrace it and adopt it and then we put it into practice but in truth you know, transferring knowledge into practice, or they call it KTE, um, the knowledge exchange, knowledge to exchange, or knowledge to practice, or knowledge, to, or you know, know to do paradigm, is really a very dynamic phenomenon that requires a lot of moving parts, and it's not, um, it's not so simple, and. For our patient population, there's an extra layer of complexity because the patients, again, that we're taking care of, we don't see all of the outcomes until they're grown up because they're so new. So what I want to throw out to you guys, okay, is let me pull this up over here, is I've put together this idea of a tribe, okay? And um, what I want to do is I want to create a tribe. I want uh, folks to join. And, um, and what you're going to be joining is working with me to really start figuring out better ways to disseminate the information that we uh, that we know is so important to transform the care of the patients. Um, so you'll all be um, participating in a closed Facebook group, Facebook group. I'll be giving you weekly posts, articles, videos, anything I can get my mitts on to stimulate discussion. My goal is to really kind of throw it out to you guys to help us all collectively problem solve and create a strategy for transformation. Um, my last quote is about is from I kind of adopted it from Maya Angelou, who does this beautiful video about how we can actually be rainbows in the clouds of others. And, and I feel like that's really what we do when we're fully present and mindful and on point for those those magic moments that we have at that shared interface of care with other. And it's just me and you and we are with each other and I'm supporting you, I'm, I'm tuned into you and you are guiding the caring encounter. And I'm, and I'm showing that and demonstrating that and role modeling it for parents because that's the gold standard, parent at bedside doing all the care. Um, the FI care model, I just saw a recent um, request or publication or something you know, about training parents about you know, supporting babies do ROP exams, adjusting the oxygen, um, doing all of these things that they absolutely can do. These are tasks. You don't need to have a nurse do these things. You need to have somebody who's competent in turning a knob and understanding why they're turning the knob. And I get to be the mentor and the support for the parent doing that. I'm coaching them. I am solidifying their identi identity as a, as a parent. But it can't just be me, Mary Coughlin, like getting evangelical about this as I do all the time. And God bless you all for listening to me. But I need you guys too to help me. And so is you know as part of this um, invitation and this package to to work um, with me, I created this blueprint. It's a twelve page um, document that let me see if I can share my screen. Turn screen share on. Um, um, hold on. I got yes. I'm going to do this your entire screen because I can't. I'm just too lame. I can't figure it out any other way. Share the screen, and I'm going to find my um, blueprint. So I hope you can see this because I can't see it if you can see Yes, yes, yes. All right. So it's a 12-page um, blueprint. And it's just kind of getting you off and started talking a little bit about neuroprotective care. Um, why is this important? What it is for the uh, babies? What it is for you? Um, my quality metrics um, for trauma-informed care. And then it's really putting, you know, putting you in the hot seat um, and you know, having you begin the work of creating a vision for the future, or how would you adopt to best practice? What would it be? Um, and that sort of thing. So um, that's one piece of it. Um, I also have a, um, oh, fudge. I, I didn't mean to show you me. Um, let me go back to my slide deck. Um, I've also, um, created this, um, it's a 1.5 hour um, uh, webinar and it's called Hot Topics in Critical Caring. Um, and um, I think it's really good and I thought I would also include that as part of this um, package uh, to join the tribe. And um, you could use it for training, for engagement um, with your own staff. And um, and then of course being part of the, um, the Facebook group um, because my, my kind of next mission, if you will, 
is to really um, start looking at how we can write some quality measures through the National Equality Forum. So the National Equality Forum invites people, their mission is to lead national collaboration to improve health and healthcare quality through measurement. I'm all about measurement, all right? I mean, you, you have to be able to measure um, to know that what you're doing today is better than what you were doing yesterday. It's not just, oh, we're just doing something different, but we don't know if it makes a difference. You have to know it makes a difference. I wanna see, I wanna eliminate that suicide risk. I want to fully engage with the opportunity to prevent suicide in this profoundly vulnerable patient population as it is a statement of the quality of the care that I provided this infant and family during their most vulnerable um, period um, in their development. And so what they do is they invite folks to um, to put forth, to develop their, what they think are quality metrics. And certainly they have to be evidence-based and all that other kind of stuff. And it really got me thinking like, well, gee willikers, um, there's lots of people out there that want to do this, but we need to do this collectively and cohesively. Um, and so if you're game, okay, um, I'm inviting you to do something great, okay, um, to join the tribe. It's $47. It's going to give you the um, the blueprint. It's going to give you the 1.5 hour video, and it's going to give you lifetime access to the Facebook page where we're going to give weekly posts, and we're going to... Um, we're going to sort this out and we're going to really start moving the ball in a meaningful direction to change things um, in a quantifiable way that's not just quantifiable, right? It's going to be qualifiable, right? It's going to really improve the quality of lives of the patients we serve, their families, and ourselves as well. So, you know, think upon it. Um, let me uh, see if I, I still have that up there. I'm, I'm again, still... Uh, trying to negotiate and, and understand this. These are some of the um, upfront in your face um, references that I wanted to share with you. Um, I'll also send along um, the, um, the PDF of this slide deck if you um, are interested in that. Um, I do have all of your email lists, your email addresses from the registration. So if you'd like, um, I can also send you this, the Nuslock, um, the more and the more and the Sanders paper, um, I can send you those as well. So, um, you know, I, uh, I'm gonna shut this slide deck down, I guess. Um, let me see how to do that. Stop the slides. It's just me, hi, my kind of messy office. And I wanna open this up now to um, some questions, you know, that you may have. Um, about either joining the tribe or the work that I do, or um, maybe individual um, uh, questions that you have about the content. We've got eight minutes and I'm, I, I love questions. Mary, is there a clinical psychologist conducting research in the NICUs? Um, you know what? I will find out. Um, I know that, um, I mean, Heidi Lee's Alice is a clinical psychologist, and so is uh, Monteroso, um, Rosario Monteroso. So, um, you know what, I'm going to make a note, and I will send you those names. Actually, I think I can just type them in here. So look up Monteroso, oops, me, Monteroso, um, Rosario, and um, his lab partner, who does a bulk of his, um, the research with him, too, is Livio... Provenzi, okay? So um, you can check those guys out. Um, uh, Ellie, yes, if you just go on to the, the, um, uh, the replay, you'll, ha you'll get a replay um, button. You should be able to access it. And just if you can't, just follow up with me, okay? Um, so Robert, uh, Bertie, I hope that that um, answers that question. Um, as far as in the US, um, I will do some due diligence and check that out. I'm gonna put a little box here and look for US psychologists research relative to the NICU. Um, you know, what you just made me think about though is um, there's this really cool book. Um, hold on, I'm gonna get it. Uh. Okay, I hope you're not seeing my shorts here. Okay, you are. Um, it's this book here. It's called Scared Sick, The Role of Childhood Trauma in Adult Disease. Um, and um, it was, it's by uh, Cara Morse, her last, that's her last name, K-A-R-R hyphen M-O-R-S-E. And um, there's an entire, I'm just looking for the copyright when it came out though. 
2012, and there's an entire chapter in here um, about what they're calling the little traumas, prenatal and perinatal. And there's an extensive talk about um, NICU and premature people. It is actually very interesting for labor and delivery, I think, you know, I mean, because that, you know, there's that preparatory um, piece as well. I'm uh, one of the folks, um, Nancy, on um, my uh, Quantum Leap um, program was um, talking about, you know, the need for this information to really kind of transcend across the, the perinatal continuum. Um, Nancy, if you're still on the call, um, you know, you may want to uh, touch base with Barbara. Um, if um, Okay. Oh, yes. There you go. <laughs> Please send the info. Okay. Yes. 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 Oh, the fee. What was the fee? It's forty-seven dollars um, for the um, for the uh, the the tribe bit, um, and it, that's it. It's just it's a one-time fee. That there's no other recurring fee, and you're just you just get you get stuck with me for the rest of your life, or as long as you can tolerate. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like you know when I saw the opportunity with the National Equality Forum that they're looking for professionals um, and collaborators to really craft um, what are those unique indicators specific to the patient population they serve, it just made sense that um, you know, we, would, we could connect and we could do this in a real meaningful way. Um, uh, I mean, at least begin the process because we've got evidence-based guidelines and that's what CMS is requiring. And so wouldn't it be really cool to, um, to really to, to address that in a meaningful way. Um, Carolyn, you're doing your PhD work on NICU environment and its effect on neonatal brain. Any info you have about that would be great. Yeah, I mean, hey, I'm telling you, join the tribe, my friend. You will, you will learn so much um, with, these, uh, with our weekly posts and literature um, discussions and, and that sort of thing. Is the tribe through Caring Essentials? Do I join there? Yeah, so um, on this, um, let me see where I have it on this. Is there an, uh, a thing here that says blueprint for trauma informed care, do something great. Um, if you just click join, it should bring you right to the page. Um, but I'll also follow up and send the link to you as well. Um, it, you know, I'm, I, I'm still kind of working out my technical savviness, if you will, um, with this platform. Although I do love the fact that you guys are all looking at me and I can look at you. Well, I can see you guys um, chatting up the storm and, and really engaging. I'm so wicked excited. Yay, Carolyn. Um, Pam, thank you. You always percolate more learning. <laughs> thank you very, very much. That's what it's all about. Um, I just think it's going to be really amazing. Um, I'm hoping, are there little things that help decrease isolation by using huggers. So absolutely, Barbara. I mean, if the parents are not present, absolutely use in huggers. Um, music therapy, aromatherapy, aromatherapy. Um, you know, there's um, they're still testing it. I mean, there has been some lovely um, studies done around, um, obviously, maternal scent, right? You can't beat that. Um, a colleague of mine, Kathy Randall, um, she uh, her specialty is AEEG um, stuff, but she also does the ONE conference, which includes neurodevelopmental care. Um, but she also kind of on the side does stuff with aromatherapy. I'm putting her name here for you um, to check out. Breastfeeding and skin to skin, however, is just, um, it has to help. It absolutely helps. We have just such a burgeoning body of evidence to support it with Cochrane re reviews now linking, um, you know, skin to skin and breastfeeding as evidence-based non-pharmacological strategies for procedural pain. Um, and, you know, there's a group up in um, Canada that's done a really nice training video series with the mom doing skin to skin and the clinician doing a heel stick, the mom breastfeeding and doing a heel stick, and then, you know, kind of the no parents available. So we're doing containment with sucrose and a pacifier and a heel stick. So yes, I mean, there's all of these different ways. I, and, um, and I think what we need to do is almost kind of like, you know, what's the gold standard across the board? It's the parent. Absolutely. And, and you know, I know some people go, well, they don't come. I can't get them here. That's our biggest struggle. Then look at that and get to the root cause of why aren't those parents there? And a lot of times you may uncover things that, you know, these folks, they're drowning in crisis. They're overwhelmed. But if you if you peel back all of that and you and you look at the core of what is birth 
It's a defining moment in someone's life. It's in the, in the per person that's being born, but also in the family. And so capitalize on that and understand that we need to do everything we can to preserve that integrity, to preserve that connectedness and that sense of safety and that love that no matter how much you love your patients, they will never feel as much love as they will from their parent. No matter what you think of their parent, no matter what baggage that parent brings, we, we need to get to this. And, and sometimes that, that barrier, and I kind of um, meant, you know, in, ask you to challenge, challenge yourself to um, identify what are the barriers and obstacles in your environment um, to, um, to operationalizing full-on, beautiful, glorious, trauma-informed neuroprotective care. And sometimes it's the person that's sitting at the welcome desk that's a grumpy Gertie and that makes everybody feel like, oh God, you know, I'd rather go to the dentist than come here. Make them, they don't, they don't feel welcome. It begins there. And if these people do have, and everybody has baggage, we all have baggage, but we need to learn how to peer past the baggage and see that loving, beautiful human being that is there, that is, that wants to, you know, do the best for their, their baby. And if it means that they have extended family that support, that's their support ne network, come on. We need to embrace them as well. I know that there's challenges, you know, and I, we have to work through these nuances in ways that don't make the parents or the family pay the price for the limitations that we have in our environment. Bye, Birdie. Thank you. Whew. All right. So I do get really passionate about this and I can't help it. But um, I am so wicked excited to, you know, have the blessing that you guys, you know, are sharing this passion with me and look forward to working with you guys. Um, you know, oh, good. OK, yeah. Um, looking forward to working with you guys in the days, weeks, months and years ahead to really begin the good work that, ne that needs to happen, that has to happen. Babies can finally relax in parents' arms. Exactly. They know that they are the ones that don't hurt them. Exactly. Um, I mean, we can't provide that level of care, but but we can facilitate it. Thanks, you guys, for the kudos about the passion. <laughs> Look at my face is so red right now. Um, absolutely scary moment for everyone, even if you have great support systems. I, I cannot even begin to imagine. I cannot even begin to imagine. So um, so I, I want to thank you guys. I, I it's, it's, it's like... A, it, it, it's just such a relief to be able to share this with folks that really are aligned with me. And um, I want to thank you very much um, for joining the tribe, for joining me today. And I really look forward to our future collaborations. We can do this. We're going to do something great. Whew, bye, you guys. Have a wonderful rest of the day. All right. Take care. And as always, care well.